In recent years, there's been growing interest in what's called the social justice movement. So how are we as Christians to think about issues like this? How involved should we be in cultural and political matters? Today on Truth For Life, Alistair Begg addresses these important questions with a message titled, The Kingdom of God. He's teaching from John chapter 18, beginning at verse 36. The story of the Bible is essentially a tale of two cities. It is the record of the establishing of the city of God and the city of man. St. Augustine is the first to give to us a history of biblical record and of the development of secular history in a way that articulates this with clarity. And in his great philosophy of history, he explains how the city of God and the city of man exist and will exist in parallel to one another. The secular city, i.e., is of man, that is, it is bounded by man and his horizons. It is by man insofar as man is its creator and it has man's own values. And it is for man insofar as its glory is the glory of man. Now, in contrast, you have the building of the city of God. Unlike the city of man, it is established by God and differs in its standards and in its goals and in its destiny. We are by nature part of that secular city. It is as a result of God's grace to us in Christ that we are made part of the city of God or of the kingdom of God. John 3, Jesus to Nicodemus, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He lives in the proud creations of his own secular mind and destiny. Unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And Paul describes the great transfer that has taken place in the lives of the believers in the Colossian Valley when he says to them, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light, for he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. That is the secular city. And he has brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. Of all the things that have happened to us in regeneration and in being brought to faith in Jesus Christ, our circumstances have been radically altered. Our foundation has been transformed. Our goals have been redefined, and our destiny is absolutely established. In the secular city, man lives on the basis of what is seen. In contrast, the city of God, which is unseen in its dimensions, carries with it great expectations. And Paul in 2 Corinthians 4 puts it in a compelling way where he says, So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Now listen, the church in the Western world needs to refocus the lens And we need to go back to the Bible and pick up the pages of Scripture and say, now, wait a minute here. Let's make sure if, having been brought into the kingdom of the Son whom we love, our eyes are to be fixed on what is unseen, from whence cometh all this discouragement, all this despair, all of this preoccupation, because someone has told us that we are actually to have our gaze fixed on what is seen. As if in Peking and Washington, D.C., and London and Hong Kong, the destiny of humanity rested. For we know that it rests with a sovereign God who is providentially interested in the affairs not only of individuals and of fellowships, but in the setting up and in the bringing down of kingdoms. There is then a conflict, an ongoing conflict, that is represented in these two cities. Well, then, given that we're involved in that kind of war and given that that kind of conflict exists, the question before us in the time that remains to us is, how are the people of God then to view the conflict, and what are we to do about it? 
are the people of God supposed to be endeavoring to take over the city of man and make it a paradise? The Bible answers, no. Are the people of God then simply to withdraw from the city of man, to live in our own separate little city, where we can have kind of an us for no more shut the door mentality, and make sure that everybody believes what we believe, sings what we want to sing, and uh, dresses the way that we think they should dress? The Bible answers flat out, no. Jesus made it clear. Father, I thank you that you haven't taken them out of the world. In fact, I pray that you don't take them out of the world. I pray that you keep them from the evil one. Father, they are living in a secular city as members of your great city of God. Their passports are stamped with a different country of origin than the people around them. Now, Father, let us enable these people to understand the conflict between the kingdoms, and to engage in the right kind of battle. Well, then, if we're going to avoid both extremes, either absorption or total isolation, uh, what's involved? Let me just say three things. Number one, we need to make sure that we're fighting the correct war. A gentleman who would be well-known to you here, a well-known man in the country, I don't want to mention his name, writes, the battle against humanism is moral, not theological. That is not true. The battle against every force that is ranged against Christ and his kingdom is ultimately theological. And if we determine to fight on the level of the moral, then we may expend millions of dollars, thousands and thousands of manpowers of energy, and end up engaged in the wrong war. Now, I owe a great debt to Michael Horton for these rambling comments. And Horton, on one occasion in this particular book, says, until we begin to see the deeper issues and regroup to learn all over again what we believe and why we believe it, we will continue to mistake symptoms for illnesses, effects for causes, and the fruit for the root. Our responsibility is to state again into our world the facts of divine revelation in Acts 17. God made the whole world and put everybody where he wanted them. Mankind rejects that. I don't care. That's what the Bible says. That God has set a day when he will judge the world. Mankind rejects that. I don't care. That's what God says. And consequently, God commands all men everywhere to repent. When Paul preached in Corinth, and you go back and read your Bible, I must. When Paul preached in Corinth, it was not to challenge the immorality of a pagan culture, but to confront the issue of sin, the standing of men and women in Corinth before the judgment of God, And consequently, since he understood what the real predicament was, he knew what the only answer was, and that's why he preached the atoning death of Jesus Christ and the doctrine of justification by faith. But if you see all he had wanted to do was kind of clean up the externals in the city of Corinth, then he could have detected on multiple levels. He chose not to because he didn't mistake the fruit for the root. He didn't mistake the symptom for the cause. He didn't mistake the pimples for the illness. Loved ones, you are sensible men and women. Think this out. Is there not just the sneaking possibility that we have been snookered in a postmodern age by the evil one who wages wars against our souls into fighting the wrong war? Nothing could be more devastating than to have so many people genuinely, realistically mobilized and motivated and yet engaged in the wrong battle. We also need, secondly, to fight in the right way. We need to fight in the right way. I have a fixation with dandelions. I hate the little things. And I determined that I would root them out and get them gone, you know. And I went out and chopped their heads off with regularity. 
I chopped their heads off with frequency until I realized that if I was going to deal with these dandelions, I was going to have to deal with them one at a time on my hands and knees. I'm going to pull these babies out by the roots. Now, here's the thing. Every day that I live my life here in this wonderful land of the brave and the home of the free, somebody in the Christian world tells me about another dandelion's head that we're going to have to chop off. And although, although we may be agreed about the ugly nature of these conditions and determined that we want to take a few heads off, in the hope that if we just take a few heads off, the other one, seeing that their next-door neighbor got their head chopped off, will shrink into the ground and die, you know, as a sort of response to it. I'm going to tell you it's not going to happen. When we assume that the issue are the dandelion's heads of premarital sex, abortion, uh, political consciousness, etc., etc., and we determine that this is the way in which we're going to engage in the warfare, that's where you get all these unbelievable and unlikely amalgamations. Some of the most unlikely bedfellows, Protestants and Catholics and Jews, and even now Mormons and Islamic fundamentalists. Now, I understand the basis of it because they're saying, you know, at least we agree on these things and the battle is this, and therefore if the battle is this, we better unite over this because this that unites us, the challenge is so great that what unites us is greater than what would ever divide us. There's the problem. That is wrong. What divides us is greater than whatever would unite us. Now, you've got to think this out. Neither is there salvation in any other than the name of Jesus Christ, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And the doctrine of justification does not mean whatever we want it to mean. It means what it means. And for people to continually stand and say to well-meaning Christians in this land, the issue of the warfare is so great that we cannot allow these little doctrinal trivialities to keep us apart from one another in the battle is one of the great hoodwinkings of the evil one at this point in history, I am absolutely convinced. He knows he fought the battle of modernism and ultimately lost it because nobody goes to those silly churches anymore. Why would you go there and listen to a man dribbling down his chin, telling you that Jesus wasn't who he said he was, that the uh, miracles didn't happen as he said they did, that there will be no return of Jesus Christ, and so on? Any sensible person says, this is bogus. Let's go play golf. Let's join a bowling league. Let's do something worthwhile with our lives. And so the devil looks down. He says, that was the modernism thing at the turn of the century, the Scopes monkey trial and all that business. And now he's got these dwindling little groups. Oh, now, he says, we'll do it the postmodern way. And I'm not sure that many of us have actually recognized the battle that we're fighting. And so we're running around taking off the dandelion's heads. The mission of the church, check the Bible, is spiritual. And political consequences are derivative. When we reverse the order, we become simply another lobby group and the watching world assumes that we are playing the God card simply to uphold our political strategy. The church is to witness to the truth of Jesus Christ and not to the claims of a political party. The church as an institution is not called to the task of forming particular public policy. Christian individuals, both within government and as exercising our democratic privileges, are called to that task, but the church as an institution is not called in Scripture to that task. We are called to speak for the oppressed and for the downtrodden and for the unborn. We are supposed to be concerned about the unwed mothers. We are supposed to display a heart of compassion. And there will be genuine disagreement amongst believers as to the legitimate role of government in that. But don't confuse that with the issues of the gospel. We've got to make sure we're in the right war. We've got to make sure we're fighting the right way. And we've got to make sure we're using the right weapons. What are the weapons? Well, says Paul in 2 Corinthians 10, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Jesus Christ. And how do we do this? Well, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. 
and he speaks about our weaponry, prayer, the preaching of the Word of God. When the Word of God is preached, the voice of God is heard, and it is a crisis of confidence in the authority of the Word of God in the lives of many of my peers that prevents them from simply upholding and proclaiming this book. There is a passion in my heart for young men to get serious about reading the Bible, explaining the Bible, and trusting that the Spirit of God will do His work through His Word. He doesn't need our funny stuff. Now, you see, when there is any lack of conviction concerning this amongst the people of God, if we lay down the weapons given to us by our commanding officer, we will be forced to take up secular methods. And so we will use secular methods to fight the issues of secularization. And when Satan neutralizes the church, it will always be that he seeks to move us from this uncomfortable message of Jesus Christ and Him crucified, being proclaimed by some of the most unlikely people. And he will encourage us to believe the lie that if only we could become a powerful force, then we would be able to do what needs to be done. Loved ones, here is the amazing irony. At just the point when in the history of Western civilization our culture is becoming increasingly otherworldly, men and women are recognizing the fatuous nature of scientific rationalism. They realize that it holds no answers for the deepest questions and puzzles of their life. They're saying, for example, in the words of Sting, you know, I have lost my faith in science. I have lost my faith in the church. I have lost my belief in this. And then he says, but if I should ever lose my faith in you. Now, what is he saying there? He's saying that it is only in this dimension of relationship that there is any hope and security for him. And that, in a sense, is the message of the gospel. Oh, God, says Augustine, our hearts are restless, and they remain restless until they find their rest in you. At just the point where our friends and neighbors are going in the bookstores and they're saying, I've got to find a book on, on something that will speak to this issue of my heart. Just when we, who know that the kingdom we're building is God's kingdom, who know that the city is not a secular city but is God's city, what are we doing? We're standing on corners. We're phoning 1-800 numbers. And we're content to be called a coalition when Jesus never established a coalition, but determined that he would build his church. I'm not a member of any coalition. I'm a servant of the church of Jesus Christ. I don't know all the answers to these questions, and that's pretty obvious to many of you this morning. But let me say, if I may, like the prophet Amos, because I get to run out of here and I probably need to, we dare not see salvation in terms of accomplishing political and moral victories, of making America a Christian nation as Israel of old. Can I say to you humbly and suggest you check your Bible for this? There are no Christian nations, ultimately. There are nations that have been and are influenced and shaped by Christian beliefs and values to varying degrees, but there are no special nations on earth anywhere. And God does not have some primary focus on Britain or on America. He is as interested this morning in Nepal and Taiwan. Why? Because he is not building a secular city. He is building his kingdom. One day, says John, looking forward on the island of Patmos, we will resound with the wonder of it all when the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. As long as we loved ones have a theology which continues to place us in an adversarial relationship with the culture in which we live, we will be involved with art only when we're trying to censor it, with politics only when it is a quest for control, with science only when we're opposing evolution, with AIDS when we're reminding people that they deserve it, and with education only when it's about prayer and sex and condoms. He said, what are you saying? I, I, I hear you saying, Al, that actually there were one of two extremes, and you've now chosen the, the isolation extreme. No. 
This is the classic illustration of it etched in my mind. I get a couple of letters for this, but I'm used to that. When Lennon and McCartney and Ringo and George, the four boys from Liverpool, came to America in the 60s, in one classic encounter, they were welcomed at a southern airport by youth pastors and their youth groups. And the youth pastor had encouraged his youth group to come to the airport to welcome the Beatles. And they were going to welcome them with a big fanfare of light. They were going to light fires of welcome. And they took old oil drums and put them on the tarmac in the airport, and he encouraged the youth group to bring their Beatles albums to throw in the oil drums so they could set fire to them and burn them as a kind of welcome when they arrived, you know. Because all of that bad stuff, you see, like, uh, she loves you, yeah, 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 she loves you, yeah, 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 she loves you, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so the Beatles come off the plane to the rip-roaring welcome as the city of God misunderstands the opportunity to interact with the city of man. Okay? Now, you fast-forward it. It's 1980. It's an interview with John Lennon in the Dakota building. He doesn't know that he's about to end his life at, the, at an assassin's bullet. They're reviewing his life for him in Rolling Stone magazine. They ask him about some of his records and some of the songs he'd written. They said, what about help in 1965? Oh, he said, when I wrote Help in 1965, do you remember it? When I was younger, so much younger than today, I never needed anybody's help in any way. But now I'm older and I'm not so self-assured. Now I found I changed my mind. I opened up the door. Help me if you can. I'm feeling down. And I do appreciate you being round. Help me get my feet back on the ground. Won't you please, please help me? Said Lennon in 80. That was the cry of my heart, and no one came with an answer. Why? Because we were too busy burning the stuff in oil drums, and we have not learned a great deal in the last 35 years. Every kid out on this avenue, with the rings through every pierced piece of his body, is the object of the affection of Jesus Christ. People need the Lord. A sobering reminder and an urgent challenge. You're listening to Truth For Life and a message from Alistair Begg titled, The Kingdom of God. As that closing story illustrates, each of us has a responsibility to preach the word because the world is in desperate need of hope. That's why here at Truth For Life, we're committed to teaching God's Word every day. When you support this ministry financially, Truth For Life becomes your ministry. You're reaching out to listeners all around the world through this program. And to say thanks for your support today, we'd love to send you a book titled The Pursuit of Holiness by Jerry Bridges. How do we define holiness? We know that we serve a holy God and that we've been called to lead holy lives. But exactly what does that look like? Well, Jerry Bridges in this classic book takes an important look at what it means to pursue holiness, even as we recognize that God is the one who empowers us. Request The Pursuit of Holiness when you donate today by calling 888-588-7884 or if it's easier, you can give online at truthforlife.org. I'm Bob Lapine. Tomorrow, Alistair begins a new series called Amazing Love, looking at the story of the prodigal son and the father who constantly pursues his children. The Bible teaching of Alistair Begg is furnished by Truth For Life. Where the learning is for living.